up, everybody? Welcome into another Talk To Me Tuesday night. We're hanging out with To Me with Talk To Me Podcast. This is David from Dead. What is up, everybody? We are here back live on another Tuesday night. Talk To Me Live. And we got a special guest this week. It is Mark Hunter from Chimera. And we will be talking about their second release. So let's just go ahead and bring him in. I know you guys are already waiting for it. So bring in Mark Hunter. Hey, hey what's going on? There. What's up, Mark? How are we doing? All is well. I'm actually up a little bit past my bedtime here. It's 9, 9 p.m. I'm so old now. I'm usually asleep. But I'm glad to be here. That's for sure. <laughs> I thought it was funny. You and I were texting at like 8 o'clock this morning, and the fact that we were both texting each other at 8 o'clock in the morning is proof that we are in our 40s. Oh, yeah. I was up at like 4.30, so I'm I'm, I'm that old now. (laughs) Already got some comments coming in. If you're watching on YouTube, watching on Facebook, make sure to comment. Uh, Luis says, what up? Hey, hey, what's going on? That's always good. So let's uh, we've got some people watching. Let's go and get a few things out of the way first. And since we are talking about the impossibility of reason... Uh, May 13th, 2003, is that the date it came out? <laughs> I like that you're like asking it. this time because last yeah. time... Well, last time I just assumed. <laughs> yeah, last time Wikipedia was inaccurate. Um, yes. That is the correct date. So we are on we are on track for success today. Uh, produced by Ben uh, is it Schigel? Schigel. Schigel from singer from uh, Switched, correct? That's correct. Got some people coming in. <laughs> he says he's older than us and still up. Robert Cochran. Yeah, I, I still can get it up too, even though I'm old. <laughs> Louis, 10 o'clock is his bedtime for sure. What well, up, Metal up, Moses Damian. from Damien Chambers? Roberts, hey guys. And. Loved the pass out analysis. This is going to be great. Well, don't put too much stock into yeah, it just yet. So. Hopefully, hopefully, Good. Be great. Okay with it. great. That's a lot of ass. <laughs> that's a tall order. Yeah. This will be all right, man. Well, let's uh, let's dive into it. Like we said, all right. So the uh, producer Ben, how did you know him? Was he just a local guy? I'm assuming was switched. So Ben is an, an old uh, friend. We. we Man, I've known him. I was actually talking about this the other day uh, with somebody else, but I met him in line for Metallica tickets for the Black Album. So we're going back quite a bit. 91, I want to say. And the way our the way our city was set up, where we grew up, there were two different junior high schools. And he was from the other uh, junior high. So we hadn't all met together yet in high school. So we actually met each other in line for Metallica tickets and just had commonalities in in music and metal. And he was a musician, played drums. At the time I was playing drums, learning to. And uh, eventually he, he got into producing. He was the first person I ever knew that had recording equipment. He turned his garage into a studio and we're talking in high school this is mid nineties. So really cool stuff. And we all had a place to record as young bands and he did a lot of our early demo work and then did our EP called, um, well, I'm blanking. That's hilarious. This present darkness. And, uh, so once we did pass out and, we had the experience of going into uh, a big professional studio in Los Angeles and having all of this, I guess what you would say, a a professional approach in terms of industry standards back then of creating an album where Ben's studio was still in a garage and it was quote unquote local, wasn't as high tech or maybe, um, filled with as much expensive gear as some of these professional places. But we had an energy and we had a familiarity with Ben. Um, and he's kind of like our mutt laying, if you will. I've been listening to Def Leppard this week and I'm just picking up on uh, how important 
what Lang was to Def Leppard's music. And I feel the same way about Ben. Uh, a lot of his song, or excuse me, a lot of his input helped craft how the impossibility of reasons songs would ultimately turn out. He's like a, a, a silent writer, if you will. Yeah, it's funny. You're talking about Def Leppard, someone, I guess you were posting the ABCs of metal or something, and you you were like, everybody I know wants Deftones, but you threw up Def Leppard. <laughs> so I know you're in a kick. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm like, I love I love both bands, but I mean, I can't be, I, I haven't listened to Def Leppard probably since I was like 15, 14 years old, <laughs> like really like intently <laughs> listening, you know, just hearing songs on the radio is a total different story. But, so it's interesting to go back and check out their progression from, as a band. And, and I think right. producers, especially someone like Mutt Lang or Ben in our case, not every producer is there to help, you know, write songs. A lot of times it's just people that were almost glorified engineers where some producers actually sit down with the band and, you know, he was like our Bob rock, if you will, helping fine tune our songs and make them a little more accessible and more memorable and catchy and, and all that sort of thing. And I think that is the best, you know, types of producers. J- Jason Sukoff was like that for us as well when we worked with him on Resurrection. Uh, but ultimately, you know, Ben Ben drank the same the same local water. You know, he grew up on the same <laughs> records, and if not, he had a more expansive catalog uh, than we did. So, um, you could speak the language to him, you know, more so than, right. than somebody in LA, you know, that we had never met before. All right, so track one, is it Clensation? It is. <laughs> there we go. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I've, been, I've been terrible. I called Ro last week on Armenian when he's like Indian, so I'm, I'm not, uh, not trying to say anything without uh, uh, back, facts to back it up. So Clensation, Clensation. Uh, whose idea was it for track one? Because that's such an important track. Um, I'm usually the guy that, helped with the the mastering side of things in terms of sequencing. Um, obviously we would probably discuss that sort of thing, but it's just the energy that song has. It just felt like an opener, especially with how the drums, you know, just kind of kick it in and, and get you going with the whole uh, build up. Uh, writing it was cool. I remember writing it and everyone had like a little piece to contribute. I can, distinctively remember like DeVries writing some of the the riffs in the beginning. And that was just a cool era. That's still an era where every, everyone's jamming together and in a rehearsal studio. Um, We're not really at a point yet in technology where we're, we're able to rely so much on, on making our own music by a computer. So we were still getting together and writing. So that whole process uh, for that song was very collaborative and uh, the word is total nonsense. I made it up and it's, it's uh, funny that some people think that it, you know, it's a real word. Um, but to my knowledge, I don't think it's a real word. <laughs> That's very slayer of you to do is to, uh, to make up your own words. Um, very much so. And I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when we toured, or actually talked with, you know, we had became friends with uh, Carrie um, around this album cycle. Oh, actually at, during Pass Out, but especially during this album cycle, he, he was real fond of this album. And uh, I believe he was one of the people that might have said, thought it was a real word as well. <laughs> I mean, most people do. Why nice. would you think it's not a yeah, real it's, word? It seems like a... Exactly. It seems like one... Uh, I am noticing if you're watching on my personal Facebook page, I'm not seeing it on the uh, comment section up here. So I'll make sure to head over to the talk to me, Facebook page or the uh, talk to me, YouTube channel. If you want to join in on the comment section. All right. And then um, back and then back to the album track two is the impossibility of reason title track. Uh, and uh, on the Wikipedia, it also said it was a single, but there was no video. Was there a reason behind that? I don't believe it was a single. If it was, then I don't remember it being one. Uh, I think that that could be some more of that uh, WikiLeaks fake news um, that you're so fond of when you do these these interviews with me. I'm just kidding. 
Um, yeah, no, that wasn't a single to my knowledge. Maybe. No, no, it wasn't. Down Again, Power Trip, and Pure Hatred, I believe, were the singles. Yeah, those all three have videos, but... Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. we- yeah no. You know what? You know, I'm sorry. What what you might be thinking is, uh, didn't we have a single? No, never mind. What am I, we had a sampler that we gave out to radio stations, but that was oh, called the new heavy metal sampler. Not, not a possibility of reason. Wikipedia lies, as always. Can't trust it. You know, I heard you say that again the other day about, about you coining the phrase new wave of American heavy metal and that Camara should be more credited with that. And I thought it was actually going to get picked up a lot more than it did. And I don't think anybody touched it in the, uh, in the, in the, I don't think anybody cares, world, but, uh, you know, for, that's a pretty, I don't think anybody cares. I mean, it's just, it's one of those things. We did it during the pass out era. We had a t-shirt. We were our, our sound guy at the time, uh, Wedge, he was a big Iron Maiden fan. And before we would play every I night, Wedge. We, we would play, uh, be playing Iron Maiden over the loudspeakers. And so we just started, you know, uh, making t-shirt ideas like, oh, let's use the Iron Maiden font. What is our you know, name look like there. And then let's just change it to new wave of American heavy metal instead of new wave of British heavy metal and just kind of having fun. And then that, that caught on. And I remember like, um, getting new wave of British heavy metal albums when I was younger. And it actually set it on some of those albums, you know, they're like letting you know, that it was like the brand almost. So when we released the CD single to, um, the press uh, and radio stations. And this was just kind of like the first few songs that they could play uh, before the album was released. Um, it was called the new wave of American heavy metal sampler. And um, to my knowledge, I mean, unless someone can prove us wrong, like I don't believe that phrase exists before that t-shirt in 2001 or 2002, 2002. And the one thing about these first two tracks, like we haven't really delved into the musical side of it or even the, the lyrical content, but, you know, just out the gate, you know, it's got that Chimera vibe, you know, it's just like the, there's a riff and the sound that Chimera has that these two tracks just uh, exude, I guess, for lack of a better word. And, uh, you know, it was, it's like that, that new wave of American heavy metal that what it became but also kind of a little bit of the hearkening back to the groove metal, new metal stuff that you guys did and kind of a good uh, combination of the two, I believe. Yeah, I believe that um, our decision to tune up uh, helped showcase our, our riffs a bit differently and better and clearer. So that, that was, um, you know, one of those pivotal things that, helped change our sound into uh, something different, but it it's still us at the end of the day. So we're still going to write those groove yeah. type riffs. It was just, I think a little more audible and um, recorded in a different way to be a little bit more abrasive and thrashy, more metallic. I remember um, in being influenced by, you know, the Colin Richardson sounding albums like Carcass Heartwork and, uh, the first Amazing two machine album. Head records and Amazing albums. <laughs> those were definitely referenced, you know, um, by us for what we we're going through. Also at the gates, um, slaughter of the soul, that guitar tone. We'd actually, I remember hearing uh, through the grapevine, like how the Swedish bands, uh, put all their knobs and we were like, trying to do all that stuff the same way and might get the same way to get though that real uh, nasty Swedish metal sound uh, was something we were channeling a little bit as well. But then we got to work with Colin Richardson on that, on this album. So, um, you know, total like dream come true in terms of like production and, and, and somebody that made albums sound the way, you know, we wanted to sound. Now, prior to us jumping on this, I was kind of going down the YouTube rabbit hole and you were talking about, you know, this kind of being one of those things where you guys got in a room and jammed out. And the room that you guys jammed out was like eight by eight, maybe, 
know, it was it was a very small practice space. And th- those definitely harken back to the uh, quote unquote good old days. Yeah, and it was upstairs. I remember we had to use this rickety elevator to get all the the gear up, and you know, one of those like lifts as <laughs> you're standing on it, the whole thing is wobbling. And then, um, <laughs> hey, Justin Clark, yes, we were using fifty one fifties on that album. Um, and the steps too were wooden and rickety and just, uh, so we definitely lived in, lived in the ghetto for a, a long time <laughs> with, with the band. I think most bands do, you know, it's not like oh, yeah. rehearsal spaces aren't something you find in like the, the suburbs usually. You got, uh, Damien here, Rob just gave up your old practice space sad face i saw that yeah I, that's one of those things that thanks to the modern times of that we're living in with the uh, covid situation he obviously had to adapt to that situ- situation having kids at home and his job being you know basically living in his studio and working on all the content that he does so uh it's a bummer, you know, because we've been there for such a long time and have the, right. you know, the room that you're referencing in the dehumanizing process is just literally upstairs from where we were. So we've been there wow. for close to 20 years. Oh, wow. The, um, the next uh, track on the album pictures in the gold room and the riff up top is just an amazingly riff, you know, and, and you talked about, you know, a lot of these songs having stories behind them and stories intertwined within them. Um, you know, what's a, what's a good story with picture pictures in the gold room? Uh, that's definitely uh, just, I love that riff too. We, we use that. Um, we opened our, our last reunion show using that song and it just had that cool vibe where, you know, the, the intro just cuts out and the music's black and you hear that first riff and the whole place erupted. It was a great, great way to come back. And lyrically, you know, uh, dark room opens, no light for years. Uh, so that's kind of cool way to say hello again to the crowd. But uh, the song itself is, is about The Shining, um, Stanley Kubrick's version in the movie. And um, that's uh, the lyrical content has everything to do with that. And the samples that were used for that, uh, if you've seen the dehumanizing process, you're probably aware of this. But um, for those that aren't, you know, all the samples and sounds that Chris uh, Spacuza plays during that s- song are uh, taken from that movie and manipulated. So, But you can hear, like, if you really put it in the headphones and hone in on all the sounds, you can hear familiarities. Yeah, it's definitely... Uh... An amazing record so far. And then obviously into the next song, which is Power Trip. There's a video for this one. And uh, like I texted you earlier, man, you got to bring back the dreads, man. (laughs) I wish you knew how many people have asked me where are the dreads or why did I cut the dreads still to this day? uh, Now what? It's been 15 years. Yeah, man, they look great for, for that's sweet that you can do this. Um, they look great for headbanging in metal, right? Like, like oh, yeah. one of those unfuckwithable looks, you know? Are you allowed to swear <laughs> on here? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're good. Um, I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, <laughs> so shooting this video was a little bit of a challenge. We we were, So two things. I got to clear something up because, man, this is so stupid. People ask this question all the time. But the sample <laughs> in the beginning of the song they always like, man, does this say white power in that song? <laughs> like, first, first off, why would it? <laughs> You're like, yeah, man, like hell yeah, dude. You know, white power, love that shit. No, uh, it's actually the there was radio interference. Like sometimes, I'm sure you, you know, musician yourself, you've heard it where like all yeah. of a sudden pickups are ca- catching some frequency radio uh, CB channel or something, and um, we were we were like picking up some it sounds like a Christian radio channel or show. And he's saying uh, he stepped out of that garden. And let me tell you this, he had God like power. 
Oh, there we so go. So that's uh, the phrase that's being uttered. Uh, a lot of people always ask that, so it's kind of funny. But um, so anyway, the recording this video was a bit of a challenge. We were on the Slipknot tour, and we were in San Francisco, and it's not an easy town to just like, yeah, I'm going to go down the street and you know shoot a video. This is you're talking logistical nightmare and we had to get all of our gear and ourselves into this warehouse and record this video i want to say we're jamming and headbanging at like 7 a.m hungover <laughs> this is the worst possible conditions to be shooting a video in ever um we shot two videos in this air in the san francisco area uh, pretty much back to back this one and pure hatred and um this was filmed I mean, I wish you could tell me who the director was. It's been so long, but this was one of his first videos and he did it for free and it was kind of like a film school project maybe. Um, but it was just, yeah, such a logistical nightmare being on tour and having to like move your gear to a video shoot and then get the gear back to the venue. And we were in San Francisco it was an early show or sort of like doors are at like three or four, something so <laughs> stupid. Like you couldn't have had worse conditions to make this video, but it came out cool, especially for being free. You know, I mean, we didn't pay for it. And uh, the the guy that directed it was just a fan. So that's really cool. I feel like the Metallica Ride the Lightning shirt is like a constant with throughout the uh, Chimera or the early Chimera days. Yeah, that was Rob's thing, uh, big time. And <laughs> and there you go, Rob, with that Ride the Lightning shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, that was like kind of his signature shirt on stage for, for a couple of years almost, uh, I want to say. I remember getting one of them getting stolen at OzFest. Like, our stage clothes got stolen, right? You know, Ooh. you're familiar with playing. Yeah, you know, that sounds sweaty. terrible. But for fans that don't know, you know, after the band is done playing and you're on a tour like OzFest, like, what do you do with your clothes? They're soaked. So, you know, you usually hang them outside and – Sometimes you're hanging them off the bus and, you know, it's a hundred degrees out. So the clothes can dry a lot quicker. But yeah, one day we had like, we came back and all of our stage clothes were gone. Like, man, so somebody's, <laughs> somebody has got my camo pants out there and Venom t-shirt and someone's got Rob's and Metallica ride the lightning shirt. And oh, wow. That, that'll <laughs> be on eBay tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I'll buy them back, you know? Yeah. I mean, you yeah, know, it's Lewis, Lewis is correct here. This, this comment about Rob having Metallica guitar picks. Yeah, he uh, he has a whole collection of guitar picks with uh, the Metallica content on there. Nice. I found a, uh, last time I saw Metallica, when I was walking out, there was like a, a Metallica White Fang guitar pick. Like, I could barely see it, and I grabbed it. Looked online, they're actually a little bit more rare than the, you know, just normal picks James throws out. So I was like, all right. Oh, nice. Did I tell you my Metallica show story last time? Was that your podcast? Or I don't know who I tell stuff to. But anyway, it's just not going to make this a long story. It's just hilarious. That was the last show I've been to. And that was, what, January of 2019? Oh, wow. So, but I remember, like, just being so excited because I had the best parking situation one could ever <laughs> hope for. That's when you know you're old is when you're excited about the parking Man, situation. Like, I'm still excited about it. Like, we're fortunate enough to know they're light guys. So, you know, uh, f- free entrance and, and great seats. And so I found this like perfect valet situation. It was literally like, I couldn't have felt more like uh, a rock star when I'm not clearly not at this day and age. Uh, it's just, all right, yeah, here, I'll put my car here, just walk right into That's the not what you're, walk you're right down and boom, I'm there on, on the floor. It was, I felt like a king. So pretty cool, but great live band anyway derailed yeah last show derailed your podcast. last show i saw with him with, uh, no you're good man that's, that's what podcasts are for last show i saw rob from nonpoint hooked me up with their like head of security and he was like just text this guy and he showed me where to go and i was by myself i walk in homeboy gives me a hug like we've known each other for years he's like it's great to see you i'm like oh my god we're best friends he handed me like a handful of uh you know picks and things like that not the white fang pick but just a handful of picks Gave me like a a, a a wristband so I could go anywhere in the uh, in the venue, and I was like, hell yeah! Basically walked right in, walked right up, and James is like, you know, two two people from me for half the show. It was awesome. That's awesome. What's your next musical project? We got Mister Basil Basil says here. 
I don't have one. <laughs> or is he asking me? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, who's he asking? <laughs> no. Uh, dabs on a bus in Akron. I'm assuming that's some insider stuff. Dabs on many bu- on bus in many cities. That's happened. <laughs> we've, we've, we've crippled quite a few people. Couch locked them like permanently. <laughs> oh goodness! Uh, some facts on this album. This album debuted at one seventeen on Billboard. That's a that's a feat back in the day. It was, and I saw that too this morning, and I was thinking to myself, "Whoa, we charted <laughs> our second album. That's pretty cool." Yeah, I mean, it was a big deal back then. And there's your lady. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It sold it sold well right off the bat, and. Um. Yeah, we it, we were on our way, right? Where pass out was kind of a struggle uh, with touring and not doing as as well as we had hoped. Um, once Impossibility of Reason was released, like things started going on an upward trajectory. You're gonna answer that, Metallica or Megadeth? Man, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm Metallica all day. I uh, definitely appreciate Megadeth. But it, aside from uh, Rust in Peace, I'm not very much a connoisseur of theirs. Great album. Brandon Lyons says, Discovered Chimera on Farm Club back in the day. Still one of my favorite metal bands of all time. Appreciate that, Brandon. And I love still hearing that. That's like we talked about on your last podcast, how it, every day. <laughs> every pretty, day. Here it is. All right. Somebody has seen has discovered us from Farm Club. Sounds really right. cool. So up next, we've got Down Again. Also has a video, and one of the earlier songs on here that uh, involves some clean singing. Yeah. So making that video w- was um, pretty cool. We worked with uh, PR Brown, and he was like known for Marilyn Manson stuff at the time. And the video did not turn out as we had hoped, because if you see all that white stuff we're in, it's, it's gauze. And it's one of the lighting, uh, one of the help people helping on the set actually tripped over the lights and it sparked and the whole set caught on fire, like (laughs) during take two, something ridiculous like that. So all the ideas we had for the video were just pretty much thrown out the window and we salvaged what we could to make make this video, um, but it, it was definitely supposed to be something completely different. Uh, another thing that was awesome about that moment was because of the fire, there was a movie filming next door, and it forced that entire cast out and uh, outside with us, and we got to meet uh, James Gandolfini, uh, aka Tony Soprano. Oh, wow. He was outside and. Uh, they were filming, I believe it's called Surviving Christmas. That's the name of the movie. And um, they were filming that. And so we got to talk to him and get our picture with him and all of that. And yeah, with the clean vocals um, and this song in general, this is definitely, it, you know, and also actually Power Trip as well. Uh, those are two songs I could definitely point at where, where Ben had a lot of help in production and crafting those songs. Power Trip didn't sound anything like it does in the final version and the demo completely reworked in the studio and down again was, was completely enhanced and bettered as well uh, from the original demo version. Um, Obviously I like Alice in Chains. If you've ever heard this song, (laughs) (laughs) right. Same same with pictures. I was actually listening to Alice in Chains uh, a couple of weeks ago and I noticed, I always forget sunshine and I'm like, oh, yeah, that totally sounds like Pictures in the Gold in there. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was it was a challenge um, to sing this song at, live. I could never really pull it off. Uh, I, I sucked at it. I never get in a fight with Rob about it on tour. Uh, just, it, not, I just don't – he's like I can't hear it, you know, when you go to sing it live, and I should just know it. And uh, – it wasn't until a lot later where I finally felt comfortable singing the song. I'd always like butcher it though. Back in the day, it, it, it's a lot easier to scream. It's a lot easier to sing in a controlled situation than it is live. Like some singers just have it, you know, they yeah. just switch back and forth. I don't believe I'm one of those dudes. Uh, so it was always 
required a lot of effort and practice on my part to continuously get better, you know, to do it live. Yeah. And the, um, how many of these songs on this album do you, do you, re- do you think that were from the, uh, pass out of existence, uh, kind of leftovers, anything left over from the first album? No, I don't believe there was. I believe we started writing not, you know, not too far off. I think we were like in on tour for past out towards the end of that cycle where we started like coming up with some of the ideas like during the, the during the tour cycles um, we'll get to it when we hit stig murder but that was like the first song written for the album and um, so I don't recall anything being left over I don't believe that happened and Heather S you're asking was it your idea for the clean vocals hey Heather I don't recall. <laughs> I mean, maybe, but I think that if if ever there was a part like that where I wanted to do clean vocals, I definitely reached out for help in terms of like, how should I go about this melody? You know, how, how do I make it sound good? And that's where like Ben probably would have helped craft that. If I, There's no way I came up with that in, in the first go around. Later in life, yeah, I could maybe come up with a part like that, but that's definitely helped. Was this a thing where you guys toured off of the first album for a little while, and then when you go to do the second album, you know what to, you know what you want to put out there because you know how the crowd reacts to things like this? Yes and no. I think I, I believe just our biggest frustration was, you know, some of the reviewers, at least my from speaking from me, from my personal uh, opinion some of the reviews we got on that album for pass out, like it's like, they just didn't understand w- what we were about or what we were trying to convey. Maybe we didn't articulate it well enough. And um, so that gave us a little more fire than anything. And um, the conscious efforts to change were mainly in the, in the tuning and just a feeling that like, man, we're getting called new metal. New metal really wasn't, a bad word when we were starting, but by the time we were ending that cycle, it was just a worse and worse word. And we wanted it to be as far away from, from that as possible. Um, because yeah, like we, like, I think we talked about this on the last podcast. We like bands like Corn, but we also liked Slayer and Deicide. So we were kind of channeling more of that than we were the, the Corns of the world. We were, uh, you know, still obviously using electronics and keyboards and stuff like that, which, it was funny because as we're transitioning into playing with metalcore bands and starting this new wave of American heavy metal movement, the label as well as some other folks were like concerned that we had Chris in the band, like, because, Oh, people are going to think he's a DJ and you guys are going on tour with Lamb of God. And they're this new metal band. That's not new and you, but like right. newer metal band that, their crowd wasn't going to understand a DJ like he's not a DJ. (laughs) I don't know how else to put it, but I remember that being like kind of an issue um, from the label side of things. And, and I don't think management, but who knows at this point. Um, But yeah, we, we had to fight just a little bit to like really have our voices heard that, keys were essential to our sound and samples. And that was not a new metal side of us. That was an industrial side of us. Right. We were coming from the nine inch nails world world, not the DJ from Limp Bizkit world. (laughs) Yeah. The star Damien here says Chimera was the Metallica of my generation. I appreciate that. I am. It's too bad. You didn't grow up with the Metallica of your generation because they were (laughs) a lot better. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh man um let's go ahead and get into uh pure hatred also another video here oh this is a good story about this video bring it <laughs> that's sweet all those shots are in our trailer and the lighting or jägermeister like little flashlights that they had like <laughs> promo flashlights yeah, Jägermeister was a big deal at that time. Wasn't it, though? And it couldn't look more ghetto, right? Like, or it doesn't look ghetto, but, I mean, we couldn't have done it more ghetto. 
Um, that show was in San Francisco at the Pound, and it was outdoors. It was on the In Flames tour. Nice. Now that I day, played, I played the Pound. What's that? I played the Pound. Cool place, right? It like it has cool. a total history behind it. Yeah. Um, Todd Bell did this video for us, and he he was filming for our DVD, the dehumanizing process. So he had a lot of footage he could, he can through was able to throw into this. And then the rest of it was at a live show in, in San Francisco. And and then these shots like here with Jim and stuff, you slow it down. You could totally tell we're, we're in the trailer of our bus <laughs> where our gear was nice. And, um, but anyway, the funny story is that day, do you know, Neil M saying the photographer, I mean, I don't, he's I don't know everybody, but anyway, yeah. Uh, at the time, he worked at ILM and was working on the new Star Wars movie at the time, which would have been episode three. Okay. And um, he took me and Anders and Bjorn and a couple of the other guys from In Flames to Skywalker Ranch. Oh, wow. So we're sitting there all day getting, you know, having the coolest day ever. And, you know, I'm seeing all this like, badass memorabilia from Indiana Jones and star Wars and ET basically anything, uh, not ET, but, uh, anything Lucasfilm associated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, then all of a sudden we were like, Oh, we got to get back to the show. And again, we're in San Francisco. So for some reason it's an early night and we get stuck in the worst traffic ever. And it, it's one of those things where like, I think on earth was opening the tour and I'm like, remember being on the phone, like, tell them to keep playing. <laughs> it's one of those things where they had to play like a way longer <laughs> set. Then we had to like really draw out the set change. And just like a movie, man, the van, you know, races up, pulls up. I jump out of the thing and jump right on stage like 30 minutes late to the show. Nice. And I'll just totally ruined the show uh, for our fans so I could go look at Star Wars costume. So I'm really sorry to the fans of San Francisco. <laughs> was that the night later, they, uh, that or 17, but that's what happened. That would have been the night they opened with uh, implements of destruction. Yeah, it should have been. <laughs> <laughs> but we will get to that. You know, it's funny. The one time we played there, we were going not across the Golden Gate Bridge, but we were going another one of the random bridges over there. And uh, the 49ers were playing Monday night football that night. And Raiders fans and Niners fans, they all had their windows down and they were just screaming at each other like, you suck. No, you suck. You know, it was it was one of the more favorite football moments I had on tour. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like it's a wild area. Like they don't mess around. Yeah, that would be a, we my wife and I flew out for Mr. Bungle back in February, like right at the very start of all this uh, coronavirus uh, stuff. And like we get out there and it was, yeah, it was, it was crazy. We got to go to the uh, war field, see Mr. Bungle, Dave Lombardo on drums, Scotty Ian wow. on guitar. It was, it was a lot of fun, man. We stayed out there for about uh, two or three days, good times, but yeah. And then that's the last thing we got to do this year. Yeah. I can't believe it was August already. I haven't left, I know, right? really, really left the house since <laughs> February. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how has this affected you? I mean, obviously with the photography and stuff. Well, it's definitely hurt my phot- the photography side of what I do in life. Um, for the professional stuff because weddings were pushed back or canceled um, and businesses being closed, they're not spending as much money. Um, so um, thankfully I was able to get uh, the PPP loan for that and that helped out. So not too, I hate to say I'm not really that affected because there are so many people that are, it could be way worse but I definitely was hurting for like 11 weeks that I had to go without getting paid anything. So that sucked. Yeah. It's been a mess. I think I'm not allowed to play videos on this because I think it keeps kicking us off YouTube. <laughs> Copyright <laughs> strikes. Thanks for uh, 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 yeah. whoever you are now. Yeah. Hey, they're looking out for the best interest of you. Okay. I know they, they, we really need that extra point zero 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 four cents. <laughs> so zero 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 four. I'm not sure. I love the other morning I, I sent you a picture of a, a guy with a Chimera sticker on his car. And you're like, yeah, we never made stickers. And I was like, I'll run them off the road next time I see him. Definitely. So I was thinking about that. There was this guy, I'm assuming, I don't know why, but um, they were selling 
Chimera stickers on YouTube probably since 2002, 2003, like big ones for your car. Nice. And we never, you know, went after the person or try to put a, send a cease and desist or anything right. like that. We were like hoping like, Hey, it would be, um, <laughs> stop showing the videos. Yeah, there we go. But anyway, um, we were hoping that they would send us one at least. Right. You know, so if this per that person that made those stickers that is probably still making them 18 years later. Is that the flex capacitor behind you? Yeah. It's a, a gift. My, my wife got me for my, uh, it's for father's day. It's my three kids birthdays. So in the, in the, don't, I'm so sorry for the ADD there, but yeah, I can just see I things like that and it catches my eye. Yeah. Look, squirrel. Yeah, it's cool. It lights up, you know, so my daughter and then my two kids, my two sons, whatever, under it. So it's good stuff. What were we talking about? I got totally uh, by, uh, stickers on cars. Oh, yeah, stickers, yeah. Anyway, if that person's watching, please send send us some. That'd be awesome. Because <laughs> you owe us at least twelve fifty. It was funny. Some guy in the comment section on something you posted today was uh, talking about how he ripped like the entire album off of Napster. <laughs> just like Mark. that's a great story in itself too. We knew it was going to leak, right? So that's yeah. the era of albums leaking, and so we did a voiceover on ours. So when it leaked, everyone heard it, and it, and then a couple times in each song, you'd hear uh, someone from our Roadrunner. His name was Bob Johnson. <laughs> He said, Chimera, the impossibility of reason in stores this May. And it was just like, boom, <laughs> right in the middle of a breakdown. Uh, so we knew it was going to leak. And that was kind of our little troll back to those that were stealing it. If you could travel back to any album cycle, which would it be from the start, Damien? So it's kind of a weird and in between. So ending of actually that whole resurrection cycle through recording and some of the touring of infection, that like era. Nice. We were definitely the happiest. That was the most fruitful in terms of finances. Uh, we got on some amazing tours, some of the biggest shows we ever played. And then it all went downhill. <laughs> so this is kind of the, uh, I guess the, pass out of existence into this era you're starting to go through band members uh you know matt's joining the band and then andals leaves and then a dude with the last name of evanson comes mm-hmm. in for a minute and then kevin tally comes in uh talk about the drum situation i guess through that yeah, what a nightmare right well so matt being in the band is a little bit easier of a story to explain our original guitarist jason hagar left shortly after the release of Pass Out of Existence uh, because he and his partner at the time had a child. So he didn't want to be on tour, especially making a brand new touring band salary. So he left the band and Matt replaced him. And we had known Matt. They were good friends. So, you know, there was nothing. There was just uh, nothing odd about that one. Andal's uh, just had a... I guess like a confidence issue would be the only thing I can think of and just a life issue and didn't, wasn't really happy doing what he was doing. So it kind of set us back because it was in the middle of, you know, our, our upward trajectory. So um, we were fortunate to be able to utilize Ricky Evanson and we knew him from the tour within flames. He was the drummer for soil work and he was their fill in drummer. They had lost their drummer. So we had tours coming up and commitments to fulfill with no drummer. And Ricky was a guy sitting there that was on tour with us that wanted to do it. And we knew he had the ability to do it. So it was kind of a no brainer for us. But what we weren't realizing was this guy's from Sweden. What the hell are we doing? He doesn't have work permits. He doesn't live here. We don't have a place for him to live. Like we weren't thinking at all. So that just didn't last very long uh and personalities clash right you know these european they have their ways we're american we have our ways it's just a fish out of water syndrome for him mainly um being in our in our camp so it didn't work out that well kevin we didn't know personally but carrie king had recommended him because of the tryout that kevin had with slayer 
and Kevin was really highly considered for the potential role of being Slayer's drummer. So we were like, okay. And we had heard that Kevin had this ability to play really fast double bass, which we wanted to start going into more experimental, fast, faster types of speeds with the feet and everything. So we were definitely interested in that. And he could learn songs really quick. I remember when he came in, um, Ricky was way more uh, impromptu drummer. So if you listen to some of the recordings with him or if you watch the DVD with him, I loved it. It's very free form. You never knew what you were going to get each night. It was, whoa, did you hear that, Phil? You know, And I like that type of energy when it, it's not exactly the same as the album. But when uh, Kevin came into the mix, he had the sound that it was supposed to have. And it kind of locked us back in together again of uh, what the band was intended to sound like. And there's certain accents that drummers should be hitting a certain way. That's the way they were intended, like with the riff to match the riff. And, And Kevin really paid attention to that sort of detail. And I know Rob appreciated that because... Ricky being impromptu, it could throw off the the dynamic of what was initially intended here and there. So um, Kevin was definitely a welcome musician, but we clashed with him a little bit on personality, at least Chris and I did. But he was like the rootin' tootin' loud Texas guy, and we're like nerdy introverts from Cleveland. Like, it's just... Uh, <laughs> It's the odd couple. You know? Nice. No, I get it, man. I, I've definitely been in the bringing in new band member situation and, you know, being a new band member situation. So it's, it's never fun. And it's always, there's always a sadness when it comes down to, you're not the same five dudes that started the band. You know, it's always, it's always a sad time when it starts to kind of almost becoming like a business to where you need to keep it rolling. So you got to keep bringing more people in. Yeah. We were having such a great, run you know we're hitting Ozfest, we're having big tours in flames and we had all these commitments machine head and you know we we could we didn't have time to really think about what we were doing we just had to go for it i'm realizing this drink is making me look like i put lipstick on i don't know if it's my camera or you showing up on your end but at least on my end it does so i'm enjoying um, that never a little, a little rouge maybe is what you need yeah i'll try it <laughs> All right, let's dive back into the record. The next uh, song is the the dehumanizing process. One of the yeah. best intros ever with the explode there at the beginning. I love it. Right, yeah. So that's that's the Metal Moses song and the the, the birth of that whole uh, thing. That's a that was another one I remember writing in the rehearsal space together. I remember Matt DeVries coming up with a lot of those riffs and um, just one of those ones you just knew immediately. Oh, that's that's heavy. That feels good. It feels right. And um, yeah, that's that song is a staple live because there were like two or three parts. You could have a great crowd interaction, jumping, and then, of course, the wall of death in the beginning and uh, screaming and just chaos for that song always. That's a good one, man. And then the uh, the next song, Crawl. That's kind of the oddball. Of, it of is the an album. odd one. Yeah. So that was one where we liked the music a lot. I remember coming, trying to do vocals for it, and it just didn't sound good screaming. Like, couldn't come up with anything guttural. It just, the, the riffs don't have that vibe to it at all. So that was one that we spent a lot of time with reworking my parts in the studio to, like, actually make them a song. And... I like the song personally, but it's not something that I think we could ever translate live until maybe now, right? Like back in that era, playing that song, like trying to open up for (laughs) some of the bands. Like, yeah, man, we need, you know, you get like 20 minutes. We just need to murder the crowd. We don't have time to to play our uh, quote unquote ballad of the album, if if you (laughs) want to call it that. But it's, it's in that vein, you know, it's, it's more melodic. It's more, more of the Alice in Chainsy 
vibe that we're big fans of. And that really shined through on that one. And that kind of goes right into what I have here is kind of going into a little bit of the touring around this album. And that would be like Ozfest 2003. You guys went to Japan and Australia for the first times. Yeah. Did some shows with Inflame, Soil Work and Unearth, like we talked about. And then it also says uh, Spine Shank and El Nino. So kind of kind of bridging the gap there from that new metal era too. Yeah. So that, that was in Europe and those bands were massive in Europe at the time. We were playing huge shows and we were definitely um, competitive with El Nino still. Like, you know, we were competitive with them from past out of existence, if, you know, like sports competitors. Of course, there's a couple dick moves here and there that either one of us could have played and and did. But for the most part, it was friendly. Like, man, we're both fighting for the same thing, right? So, um, and they were a hard band to follow or... So we try if if they were following us, we try to make it impossible to follow. So that's you know, in my opinion, that's good competition. Um, so, but they 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 still had that a huge uh, fans in in Europe. I mean, those shows were like three four thousand people, some of them. So it was a huge opportunity for us to break out into that territory because they put us in front of so many people, and they had radio success with with those bands, especially over in Europe. So we could play songs like down again and it'd work. Whereas if we try to play that shit with lamb, of God, you know, three, I don't know. wasn't working as much. So we talk about Ozfest 2003. You got Ozzy corn, Manson, disturbed Chevelle, cradle of filth, Voivod. So this was what, this is the uh, Jason Newstead Ozzy tour. It is. Yeah, yeah. He was on tour with us, which was awesome. Yeah. A little, Chihuahua out with him, I remember. <laughs> yeah, he was uh, cool as hell. He was, he was super nice to himself most of the time. Yeah. You know, hardly saw him as, as wasn't out as much as a lot of the other people. But And that was the best tour ever uh, for us back then. It was like a dream come true, especially since it we, we kind of came in halfway. We weren't initially offered it. And we got a late offering and only to able to do the half half of the tour excuse me, the second half, but man, that was the shit for us. It was like kind of a surprise and like, go, Oh my God, you know, we don't have to pay the $60,000 to get on. Nope. (laughs) Just go and tour. We don't get paid anything, but just go. All right, whatever. And, um, we went out and crushed it. Um, that was another great tour to have competition with. We were competing with mainly with like shadows fall and kill switch. And because of the rotation every day, you almost wanted to play before those bands because <laughs> wear, wear the crowd out or use all the tricks. tricks yeah. Right. And then like that shit would happen to you though. Then the next day it's like, God damn it. Now I got to come up with a whole new spiel because Brian from shadows fall just said everything I was going to say. <laughs> he saw me do it yesterday. Uh, and then, you know, vice versa. I'm like, well, I know what he's going to do. So I'm going to pull that move before him next time. Um, again, all friendly stuff. The funniest thing to, to us was uh, Cradle of Filth, obviously cool band. And, you know, they have this aura about them and the black metal and, you know, they're all like evil. And it's just hilarious because they're outside for one, which <laughs> makes that hilarious. Yeah. And then two, in between ba- song banter, like the bands, a lot of new metal bands on there. So if you can just imagine uh, Danny Filth giving shout outs, like, yes, we want to give a shout out to Endo. <laughs> I mean, just like, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. He's shouting out all these new metal bands in the middle of the day in corpse paint. But anyway, that was us best. Corn uh, destroys every night. Like every time we've ever toured with them, that band is right. just unbelievably. So what did you do like the Columbus, Ohio date? Yes, we did. Mm-hmm. And so was that like a kind of a, a close enough to home show, you know, to where people came out? It was, yeah. Family got to come out to that show and see us, and yeah, there's probably a few thousand out there in the parking lot that day for us. So it it definitely felt cool because again, you know, we're we're still a band at that point, used to playing, you know, at the most a fifteen hundred seat seater if we're lucky, right? Opening for somebody, maybe Slayer, the biggest shows we played with, you know, they a couple four thousand seaters on that one, but. Other than that, you know, we're used to playing like, 
you know, the pound in San Francisco, man, like we were just talking about it. And yeah. inside it holds maybe what, 350, 400, something like that. Yeah. Another great band on that tour would be nothing face. Love that. Yeah. Yeah, love that band. Um, you know, it's funny. 2003 is kind of a time where I look back on it and, you know, we talk about this, you know, the new metal into the, the new wave of American heavy metal movement with the, a lot of the new hand, you know, the new England bands, um, you know, getting to tour with unearth at that time, unearth was one of those bands that when a friend of mine was like, check this band out and they played me the oncoming storm for the first time, I was like, Oh shit. You know, this guitar solo is back. You know, it, it was okay to be heavy again. It was okay to headbang again, like you guys were doing. And, you know, wear your Metallica shirts loud and proud. You know, it was Jinkos and, and, you know, earth tone colors were kind of going away and, you know, black was coming back. Yeah, it definitely was preferred in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, me too. But yeah, looking back, I was like, man, I wish I could have just moved ahead to that period of time. Uh, the next song on the album is Stig Murder. Nice little play on words there. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that was... Uh, I did it twice on this album. Repentless. You know, word making up. Um, that was the first song written for the album. And if I'm, if memory serves me correctly, Rob actually wrote that song initially in, in the drop A tuning that we were doing for Pass Out. And... Then we finally switched it to drop C. I could be wrong. I don't know. For some reason, I'm thinking that's how it was. Yeah, I've got a, in the notes here, it's got a very pass out vibe. Could be an old song. And obviously the you can't fuck with me part. You can never go wrong with a good you can't fuck with me. Yeah, I forgot about that, actually. It's been so long. <laughs> Jim Lamarca, our bass player, hates that song. He hates playing it. <laughs> Anything that's a little too technical. Okay. You know, anything you can't just go, oh, one, oh, one, oh, 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 one. Right. I think that might be a bit too. Oh, well, no, but anyway, no. cool. uh, yeah, he hated that song. I always roll his eyes or throw a fit. I'm like, oh, that song sucks. <laughs> 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 it's not an easy song to play on guitar. Actually, I, I, I have a cameo now, and someone requested that um, a cameo account. Someone requested I sing that song to them. But uh, I live in like a condo, and there's somebody else below me. So if I were to do that, they would think that, you know, there's murder going on. So I was like, I'll try to play, play the song guitar for him. And I just never played it before in my life and just went for it. And that it's not easy. So <laughs> nice. Well, plug your cameo. What, what do you, what do you do with your cameo there? Also cameo is cool. It's like you, you can request like birthday shout outs or, um, motivational talk. So a lot of people ask me to, you know, send them a happy or their buddy, a happy birthday or an anniversary. Um, I've done a lot of roasts. Those are always fun uh, where I got to pick on somebody's buddy, you know, or, or uh, people, bands wanting advice, you know, give us a pep talk, you know, being locked in in quarantine, stuff like that. And so I think it's cool. Instead of like a birthday card, you can have, somebody that you're a fan of uh, tell you happy birthday anyway, like flavor flaves on there. Right. Like how cool would that be if you woke up on your birthday and flavor flave was wishing you happy birthday. I'm not as cool as flavor flave, but I'll wear a clock for you if you want to want me to. I'm trying to see if I can pull it up while we're talking here. I've got a cool cameo that I, there's a few that I've grabbed. Um, Let's see if we can do this here. Share screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't hear if he's saying anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, sometimes you can't hear it. I don't know. Good, good Gary Holt. Yeah, I guess when I play it, sometimes you can't hear the the uh, the audio there. But he's just basically doing a, a talk to me commercial. I was like twenty five bucks for Gary Holt, and I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, someone uh, someone had a podcast. They wanted me to roast, so I made nice. fun of their podcast. I'm assuming nice. they'll do something similar like you did. Very good. Well, very cool. Uh, next album or next album? Next song is Eyes of a Criminal, which I believe would be a great murder podcast title. Mm. True crime type thing you're thinking of. Uh, yeah, that's cool. I didn't think of it that way. Um, so that that song, I remember playing that uh, one time, and Carrie King had come out to see us live. And not to keep name dropping Slayer, but they were a big part of our 
our lives around that at this era. But um, I remember Carrie like commenting on the set, and he's very um, matter of fact when he talks to you. And uh, just like I didn't understand why you were playing that song live, and then the ending came in. So yeah, uh, that ending is definitely the highlight of that. The, Huge, massive ode to Machine Head. Uh, <laughs> nice breakdown with yeah, the really cool kick drum patterns that are happening. And, is that old? That they just kind of keep slowing it down. Um, no, is it? Is I mean, it I'm terrible with names. Yeah, I was listening to that today. I was like. Man, the, the uh, I've got a killer breakdown written down. I mean, yeah, just kind of just keep oh, slowing right. down is great. Yeah, 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 and yeah, that song's got a sweet ending, man. That's fun to play live, and um, it always just sounded cool. But I mean, when you'd hit it and the lights, you know, the strobes would flicker at the same. You felt like Pantera up there doing that shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you catch Slayer live on their final tour? Uh, on the first leg, I did, yeah. Um, came through Blossom Music Center. Someone says it's a thousand lies. Thank you. There we go. They're just joshing us. Yeah, yeah, I love that first Machine Head album. I mean, when the fact that when they the advertisement for the first Machine Head album said for fans of Pantera, Sepultura, and Biohazard, I was like, bring it on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Same. Uh, overlooked. Song that gets overlooked. I always forget that that song's on the album. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I don't really have much to say. There's no story behind that one. It's just kind of there. Um, cool song. No. I wouldn't say it's like a top shelf song of ours, but it's definitely not a B side trash song of ours either. It's got a cool, cool uh, bridge from what I remember. Good yeah. thrash beat to it. Yeah, um, uh, Betray comes back in to play. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a cool, a like, trail. you know, like you could do a, a good hay with it. You know, it's got the hay. You know, yep, yep, you yep, know, exactly. It could be a cool, uh, you know, Ride the Lightning era Metallica song with the hay. You know, that's our escape. <laughs> there you go. It's not a bad song. No. But it's not it's not the song you put on first when you throw on Ride the Lightning. No, but it's it's definitely, I wouldn't skip it either when you're playing Ride the Lightning. There you go. That's what I. That's how I think of Overlooked. There you go. Uh, and then the last track on the album, which is Implements of Destruction on this version. I know there's a, a extended version out, but we're going to go with the, the original version. So Implements of Destruction. I wrote, you got 60 minutes on CD. Let's use all of it. <laughs> is what this song is. Essentially. Yeah, I mean, it's not really 15 minutes long. Again, like we were doing like with Pass Out, just nonsense to the end. Uh, let's see if anyone's still listening after all this time. Um, and that was a trick from the '90s, man. You know, CDs did that. Remember, like oh, yeah. the first Tool album. You're like, so they, why is this last song 25 minutes long? It's not really, <laughs> but um, same trick. Yeah, Implements was cool. I remember writing that on tour with. We were on the Kitty tour, I believe, with No One in Il Nino, and I remember writing those main riffs in the basement of the Rave in Milwaukee, and. I want to say somebody from no one, the drummer was it Billy. He got drunk and like literally went through a wall, like plowed himself, his whole body through one dressing room into another through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so one of those moments you just don't forget seeing someone. Man, I think we struck, we struck a nerve here, man. Everybody's coming in about how the great acoustic intro missing oh, tracks. Yes. Yeah, man. Yeah, that 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 whole intro Rob wrote is is incredible. Uh, we are obviously huge Metallica fans, um, and that was our moment to try to do our Orion or mainly to live is to die. Um, we were actually playing to live is to die a lot when we were on tour with Kitty when we would sound check. Um, we uh, would play the whole thing. Sometimes so we, we three guitars because we were using three guitars for the song Jade. So to test all three guitars, we played um, implement. I mean, uh, Ryan, to live, to die. To live to die. and when we were writing, when we played Jade live, 
the bridge of implements was written and we were like working that in. So if you ever saw us on pass out and saw us play Jade, the whole bridge live turned into implements. And like it was some kind of live thing we had, you know, jammed, you know, like we started, became a jam band all of a sudden. <laughs> nice. <laughs> couple of miscellaneous things i found obviously pure hatred being on an episode of mythbusters uh what was it the talk to plants or something like that the title of it but basically it was uh they look like they set up a bunch of different greenhouses some of them were yelling like obscenities at the plants some were being nice to the plants some had classical music and then one of them was uh playing uh what was it pure hatred to the plants so obviously the connection with Myth- mythbusters continues Correct. Yeah, exactly. And that from your last podcast, we talked about recording the split video and that was in the Mythbusters warehouse. So same connection. And we were fortunate to have our our song used in an episode. And I believe our song helped the plants grow faster or better. Uh, Just so it's like we're like Brondo, you know, we've got electrolytes. (laughs) (laughs) Um. But yeah, so that was that was a huge thing for us. I wanted to say something about Power Trip uh, yeah. that, that I thought was really cool and the power of that song um, that I thought of was when we played Dubai for the first time. Oh, well. Wow. Um, yeah. We had rules that we weren't allowed to use profanity on on stage or use or say any of the profane words in our songs. Kind of strict, you're going to jail type shit. And uh, so we didn't even put Power Trip in the set list. Like, what are we going to do? Just <laughs> fuck probably 30 times, right? So um, it's totally decided not to not put it on the set list. But so as we're in Dubai, though, all oh, the crowd just keeps chanting, chanting it. Power Trip, Power Trip. We're like, what the hell? Like, not only do they know us over here, but they're like demanding we play this song for them and they have no idea that we're not not playing it they have no idea that we're censoring ourselves so we don't get in trouble to not play it <laughs> so i'm thinking to myself like how are we gonna pull this off so i'm like wait a minute i don't have to say anything just put the mic out and they can sing the song so fuck it let's play power trip so every time there was a fuck in the song i would just put the mic out towards the crowd and you just hear 10,000 kids over in the Middle East screaming fuck at the top of their lungs. <laughs> so you really felt like what that meant to them. And like that, that's one of those things of oh, yeah. that oppression and that difference in culture. And you got to really feel it and the impact just one word has on so many people. It's, it's pretty incredible. How many shows did you play like that over your career where you had so many different rules and you could do this, but you couldn't do that? Or was that one of the few? One. Okay. That was it. The only other thing was Ozfest was had uh, like beyond strict stage times. You're on for 20 minutes, not 20 minutes and three seconds, <laughs> 20 minutes. Yeah. You're on 20 minutes and three seconds. That stage manager is already throwing your, sh- your, your gear off the stage. Like, that dude was serious. <laughs> like you're, you're getting off when I say you're getting off. Uh, but other than that, no, there weren't any kind of rules like that. I mean, most places we played, we were fortunate that they didn't have any types of South America was a challenge just because, you know, you fear, you, you fear your life down there for other reasons, just because of the way it is. But Were there any of the places that you went that was very, maybe, um, militarized that you know you maybe felt unsafe no just mexico and south america felt unsafe and that's just to be expected no the um and w- one of the other things we found was uh are we like i got this research crack research team um <laughs> the, uh, the the song army of me which was on the uh one of the freddy soundtracks or whatever one of the jason soundtracks um both not a bjork cover i was kind of mad yeah, I was, I, you know, I was, I try real hard to come up with song titles that aren't used. <laughs> and when I do, they're always, you, know, you always get stuck with something that's like legendary. <laughs> like, damn it. This has to be the title of a Bjork song. Uh, like one of her hits too. 
Exactly. <laughs> you but know, yeah, Helmet, I mean, Helmet did a cover of it, and it was not good. So no, I, hoping, I, I didn't I'm know that you did a, did a cover. It's weird you mentioned Helmet. I was thinking of this them this morning. Like, man, it's been a minute since I listened to Mean Time. What a great record that first right. song is. I'm like, phew. anyway, I'm going to jam that this week, I think. But um, yeah, first two albums are good. Or first yeah, yeah. Two, two Mean Mean Time and Betty. You know, you yeah. can't go wrong. And wasn't there an EP was the first thing? That's what I was saying. You know, you yeah, don't want to yeah, get right, right. you don't want to get too stickler because I'll say like the first album and they've got you know it's basically like saying you know your first album right right is passed out of existence. Well, like, well actually, no, actually. <laughs> there was a, a three song demo that no one has. But yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. So Army of Me, well, that was another dream come true. We of course we talked about this last time, but you have to have B sides and stuff and. The reason for that is back in the day, different territories were, were trying to have something beneficial for their their citizens to own. So if you're in Germany, what? why do you want to buy the German pressing if the American pressing exists so the Germans might throw on a different song? And that helps the German manufacturers and then the, prevents imports and stuff like that. And it kind of keep everyone's economies going in their own way. Um, so Army of Me was one of the B-sides. We liked the song, but didn't feel that it was strong enough for the album. But, uh, man, what a cool thing that turned out to be, because it was on Freddy vs. Jason. I'm a huge horror movie fan. A lot of people that follow me know that. And I just remember going to see the movie in the theater with Jim, Rob was there, but he wasn't like a super fan. He, he didn't really know much about the films, but uh, Jim, Jim, Jim and I were fans and it was crazy. Like they play, play the song over the credits. We actually got to see an early cut of the movie and they, they had used the dehumanizing process during their first fight scene. And I was like, Oh my God, no way. But they wound up changing that for some reason to something completely different. But that was almost the case. Like I saw a version of that film cut with, uh, dehumanizing process as the first fight scene. What that would have been so sweet, but still, like that movie's on <laughs> right now on like Stars or Showtime or something. You know, you could still access it, or maybe Hulu has it. But it's always on something. You know, people are are watching it, so we still get royalties from that. I think I got like three dollars last year. There you go. So breaking in the cash. <laughs> yeah, I know your love of uh, '80s pop culture and things like that. So I wore my rad Helltrack shirt. Oh, for sweet. Our, for, for our. Uh, from yeah. talk here. Rad, they just put out on Amazon Prime. They put out like a 4K version. Dude, Pretty I heard about that. I got to check it out. It's been a minute. so uh, I, it, looks, it looks great. Like, I mean, obviously, I've, I've only had the same VHS copy that I rented as a kid. Mm-hmm. I, I eventually bought as a kid. And uh, yeah, so so yeah. It, but the, the version on Amazon Prime looks awesome. Uh, I got yeah, a yeah. question here. If you could have been the singer for any other band, who would it have been from the star, Damien? Yeah, you know, I don't really have a preference there. I don't, I don't want to be the front man. Like, I want to play guitar <laughs> for the Deftones or something. There like, you go. Give me that job. You don't want to be Anselmo? No. <laughs> Helmet CM then Betty do live. Uh, I bet the plant listening to Pure Hatred was the toughest. Yeah, yeah. that was an Indica strain. They, uh, <laughs> I love when you and Chris goof off when playing the dehumanizing process live right before the last chorus. So funny. Absolutely. So yeah, we started putting in funny samples in between the, there's like this little break and Spakusa started putting in like the, the kid rock cowboy sample. I'm like cowboy. <laughs> like all of a sudden plays over the loudspeaker, just stuff to make us laugh. But yeah, like that's cool, Heather, that you, that you caught that because, uh, that's one of those intimate moments that us musicians have on stage. We have our little inside jokes during the set and uh, you know, that we're, we're doing every night to try to crack each other up. And uh, so if you catch us doing that sort of thing, then uh, that's good on you. I meant to pull this out earlier. And as we kind of wrap this up, I do want to talk about this album cover. Oh, cool. Not much to it. <laughs> how, how do you go from this? Right. To that. <laughs> so, um, this is so with pass out, you know, I think we talked about last time it was yeah. we had like a buddy that he just knew Photoshop and it was kind of like that cutting edge technology and just went for it. But this one was a little more thought out. If you uh, kind of look at old, not old, but they'd be old now, but the DVDs for uh, the Kubrick releases for films like Full Metal Jacket or 
Clockwork Orange. Um, they were just white with like Full Metal Jackets, white with a helmet. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just tells you the whole thing, basically what you're getting into. And I really, really liked that message and the simplicity of it and the cleanliness of it, and um, the white, you know, and everything's like you know, metal is all black and dark. So just kind of like thinking of things in that in that regard. We're from Cleveland recording in the snow. So that white cold vibe, you know, was definitely present while we were doing everything. Um, it was actually not real blood, but it was fake blood. It's a photo. Um, the same guys that worked on Mythbusters and, and um, our videos, split video and Todd Bell's and Garrett Zunt worked on this whole thing. I believe Todd Bell took the photo of that. And, uh, man, a lot of people have gotten that tattooed on them and it really helped, you know, I think logos are a big deal, you know, with, it's a universal thing, you know, when you see that the golden arches, you know what that means, just like you and the see golden that. arcs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you see <laughs> McDowell's. Um, so when you see that logo, then, you know, that's us. So that was a great way for us to brand and then, to, uh, just kind of have something cool. There was the argument, with the label was not having the name wasn't the big deal. It was getting around the parental advisory sticker. So we were still in an era where if we swore a lot, you had to have a parental advisory sticker on your album. Now, of course we know that was a badge of honor in in those days. Like, Oh, cool. We're going to sell an extra 10,000 now. Thank you. Um, But in this case, I thought it would muddy up the artwork. Like, no, you can't have this white, perfectly stark image with simplicity. And then like in the corner, have this bullshit. So Roadrunner came up with the idea to put a sticker on top of it when you, in the shrink wrapping. So it had the band's name, the parental advisory sticker, and we were clear. So that way we were able to keep just the white, stark album cover. Star Damien says, I want to name my future daughter Chimera, but my wife says no. Any advice? I just name her that anyway. <laughs> you might not say it on the birth certificate, but what's to prevent you from calling her that? Uh, yeah, and Lewis, get a divorce. You know, that's another option. <laughs> um, <laughs> I call my, you know, my dog's name is <clears throat> Cupcake, but I call her Shit Rat all the time. So I mean, it's, yeah, that I mean, works. it's whatever you want to call her. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, Back to that that logo, though, we were talking about. Um, It is kind of on the first album, am I correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, right in the ball. Yeah, I was looking at it again today. Was that something that uh, had been around for a long time? Was that like an old logo that, you know, or was that just... That logo exists, you know, I mean, I think Sepultura had it on the back of Chaos AD. The Chaos (laughs) logo itself exists for a long time. And that was kind of our spin on it. And Jason Hagar, our original guitarist, uh, designed that. And that was one of the first things, like, when we had our name. So that's been around since 98. Like, if you see some of our older demo cassettes and everything. I wish I should have. I don't have any of that stuff near me, unfortunately. But I didn't realize we could, like, show the audience stuff. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we've had we, we've been using that logo since the beginning. Cool. All right, man. Well, that was... Uh... That was the album, man. Any other any other stories or anything else you want to talk about from this album? Anything that you thought of today? Well, yeah. I mean, it was fun to look back, though. I mean, not off the top of my head, but it, you're talking now, what, 17 years ago? Years. So um, it, it was – I actually went to the band's Wikipedia page and went through it and, like, oh, yeah, that happened. I mean, it's just, it was just a cool era. that We got to work with Colin Richardson, so we went over to England to do that. That was crazy. Um, we got to, we went in the middle of fucking nowhere, England and, uh, the hell were we? I couldn't even tell you some village where they had a pub where when, when me, Jim and Rob would walk in, you know, the record scratch and it stops and everyone's staring at you. Um, but it was such a great time and we had like a personal chef there and, but it was not like what you think. It's not like the guy on the show Billions, if you watch that. It was more like, like we're in the middle of some like village getting porridge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but it was still badass. And now getting to work with Colin, like, and he, he had mixed some of our favorite records growing up and produced. So it was just really magnificent to get him to look at our stuff and it, some production nerd stuff. I can think of really quick off the top of my head was the kick drum, like getting the kick drum sound. We sampled the tones from um, Fear Factory's Obsolete. So we were able to steal the kick from uh, Edge Crusher and like, right now you can steal the snare and the kick yeah we took their kick we took panteras uh from from five minutes alone yeah yeah so you can and he had uh the kick drum sample from smashing pumpkins siamese dream and then the the dm 500 that that trigger sound everyone knows so yeah. kick drum is like a, hot, a blend of all of those combined wow and he uh, he made just a really badass kick drum sound from that, you know. So a lot of metal fans probably are familiar, might or may or may not be familiar with sound replacing, and that's just common in drumming. Where yes, your drummer's hitting the snare or the kick drum, but you're manipulating the sound after the fact, and you can use any band's sounds and tones if you have access to them. And in fact, Slipknot used our was it our snare drum uh, from the self-titled that Colin made? A lot of bands used our snare drum. I think I think Machine Head did as well. Whatever Colin mixed after us, that's our snare drum, <laughs> yeah, which is pretty awesome. Well, we've got the Star Damon here. Please do another interview breaking down another Chimera album. I so- think for the next, if you're going to do the self-title, I really think you should do Rob because okay. uh, that's his, his baby, and and he would have way more. Uh, anecdotes about that than, than I would. Thank you, Heather, for listening. Yeah, thank you, Heather. All right, man. Well, that was another uh, another Chimera album down. And yeah, we'll have to reach out to Rob and see if I can't break down the uh, self-titled with him. Yeah. Or we'll have to do something else in the future between you know the two of us. That'd be great, man. Yeah, we can arm wrestle online or something, see if we can do a virtual arm wrestling over the top. Mm-hmm. Or yeah, how would that work? Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but once I I'll turn this hat back around forwards and it's over with. Oh, uh, it'll be over. I know. And, and I might be over in the corner drinking some castor oil. So speaking of great movies on Amazon Prime, get over and watch Over the Top if you're if you're bored. You know, I watched uh, of the '80s movies. I probably watched that one way more than anyone should. <laughs> yeah, that's a tall order, man. Being able to do that more than like five or six times is that's hard. When, I mean, I, there's something about that father-son storyline, you know, and and like he's working out in the truck doing his arm, and you know, he and he rips the sleeves off of the school. <laughs> I mean, that's a good movie, man. It's a fantastic film. We've been watching uh, all the old Van Damme movies nice. um, again. So we just did Bloodsport, Kickboxer, and Cyborg, and uh, so I'm like to my girlfriend Lauren, which you know, how'd you like Cyborg? And she's like, I can't take that one serious because Van Damme looks like an elf. <laughs> so look at his hair he's wearing a sequined shirt I'm like damn it i've never noticed that before but now i can't unsee it <laughs> do, you, do you want to know your uh cyborg trivia question let's hear it do you know what cyborg is it is supposed to be masters of the universe it's part two, two. <laughs> and spider-man That's yeah the yeah they were they were writing <laughs> masters of the universe too they're like yeah no this is going to be a whole different movie <laughs> The set, it, the set pieces, some of the costumes, and that's partly why the costumes are so ridiculous. They were they were going to try to make a Spider Man movie, and then um, this is when Ca- I think Canon was able to, like yeah. Marvel was like broke, and they were um, also uh, doing the the He Man stuff. So the the set pieces. And it's not even there's no cyborg. It wasn't even supposed to be called that. It, it was uh, I've, what are they called? Um, begins with an S. Not striker, slither. Uh, damn it, I can't think of the word. Uh, I hate when that happens, especially from, from, from He Man. Excuse me, from He Man or what? No, Slinger. That's it. Oh, Slinger. Okay. So cyborg was initially supposed to be called Slinger because. Van Damme is a slinger and a slinger is somebody that helps get out of an area from, from attack. So his job as a slinger is to help get this cyborg to Atlanta. That's the point of cyborg. (laughs) 
And there's a director's cut called Slither, and it's totally edited differently, and uh, the story has changed. So Van Damme had a big part in editing Cyborg and and wanted it to have more action. And Man, those movies are so bad. They're so great. I, I can still <laughs> quote them all, and you know, yeah. it's such a great, a fun way to fall asleep, you know? Just watch stuff like that. So over the top is definitely, it's been long enough. I can put it back on again. And <laughs> it's a great film. Thank you, Thank Lou, you for watching. For in. I'm glad that you have a new fan from the start. There we go. And uh, my last thing I wanted to talk to you about was, uh, have you seen the new Transformers on Netflix with the, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, war? Uh, I'm going to get it wrong. Yeah. I saw the first episode. It's great. Uh, we got to watch the others. But, um Dude, the animation is amazing. Yeah, I love that. The animation looks so much like the original cartoon, but the storyline and everything kind of going on is very adult. So I'm yeah. like, this is absolutely perfect. I think I posted that it blows away the movies. So, uh, you yeah, know. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, yeah, I'm excited to, to finish it. I was so bummed when those Michael Bay movies came out. Came out, I was just like, oh, the Transformers don't look right. They just everything was wrong about everything. The Bumblebee movie was good. Okay. The rest of that stuff I could do without. I only saw the first one and I left it at that. Yeah, the Bumblebee movie, this the standalone Bumblebee movie, uh, I'll go with. But so, yeah. do you need to see the other one? I don't think so because Bumblebee. No, I don't think you have to. I think if you've seen the first one, you know that he he actually goes back to being a bug in the Bumblebee movie. So okay, that's that alone. <laughs> that's sweet. Well, cool, man. Well, I appreciate you taking the time tonight. As Thanks always. for. Thanks, Thanks for, for having everybody. Me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for everybody for checking have the out. World's best metal singer on your. On I your know. Show. Well, I, the, that's what happens when you email world's best metal singer at aol dot com. <laughs> <laughs> you you just magically pop up. Yeah, I need to get the coffee mugs made. Yeah. You, you what know. about you guys in the in the podcast watching? Would you buy a world's best metal singer coffee cup with my face on it? Now that's a good question. Uh, there is a little bit of a lag, so it's going to take a second. <laughs> Luis has not seen the Bumblebee movie yet. People talking nice things about my podcast. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, these live shows have been fun, man. You're the first uh, rock star to come on. You know, this has normally been other podcasters. How has your uh, YouTube show been going? Have you been doing that at all? No, I, you know, I had to stop doing it. I, uh, with my cancer, I had a weird time in December with my thyroid meds. Okay. And there you and go. Adjusting to them, and I wound up getting like not feeling well. It killed all my momentum. Um, I had to get my meds adjusted right, and then there wasn't much coming out in January or February. And then, then the COVID stuff happened. So I was just like, you know what? I'm done. Like Heather S would buy it. Do with my time. Metal Moses here, and then absolutely they would buy it. So you get at least three sales. So I'm gonna start working on world's best metal singer coffee cups now. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark. Well, I appreciate you taking the time, and we will always. do this again soon, man. Definitely. Thanks for everyone for tuning in, and and always a pleasure chatting with you. We'll we'll talk to you soon. Cool. Take it easy.